So again, welcome to my session. And today I'll be talking about hacking with Postgres, Postgres 11 PG threads. This is presentation about writing Postgres extensions and writing parallel code using them. And this presentation is sprinkled with lots of demos. I have a working project, a background project with two virtual machines running Ubuntu 16 and Postgres 11 databases in them. Uh, so this is the agenda of the presentation. I leave this page on. I will tell you a few words about me and my company. So my name is Piotr Jarmusz. I've been working for the last nine years in a company called Allegra PL as a senior database de uh, engineer. I started my career as a Postgres C, uh, Perl C and Java programmer. I never liked databases at back then until on one project I was put to uh, manage database and I finally understood how it works, I loved it. And so I became the database guy. And then I worked for some uh, four, four years as a senior database engineer in GlaxoSmithKline at Beecham. And uh, then I switched to Allegro. And what is Allegro? Allegro is the biggest Polish uh, e-commerce site. It is really huge. This is, is sixth place in Europe. We have 20 million users. About five, 5 million users are actively using our service for selling and buying stuff. And for, uh, we are on-premise company, we have two uh, server rooms in two distinct parts of Poland. But we are going to, into cloud, public cloud, using GCP, Google, Google Cloud Platform. And for database solutions, we, have, we are truly multicultural. We started with Oracle, but you know, Oracle licensing is a nightmare, so company had one uh, point in time decided to switch to uh, open source and we choose Postgres for this. We also use MySQL and NoSQL solution, Cassandra and Mongo. We also have a large uh, data warehouse uh, department. We have Oracle Exadata and a really huge uh, Spark Hadoop cluster with dozens of petabytes of storage. And um, yeah, this is about uh, the co ah, th interesting point that Allegro PL used to belong to uh, South African media, Nas media company Naspers. It was sold a few years ago for $3.2 billion and they bought, bought it for $1.8 million, so it made a lot of money for this. And Allegro is, this, this year we'll, we'll be celebrating 20th anniversary, so, and we are grow, growing on average 15% each and every year. Okay, so uh, um, let's go to the presentation. I will tell you a few words about uh, start procedures. First, I want to make, make a discussion about misconception of what developers see a modern relational data database. They think of it as a dummy data store with tables inside, which they can throw as SQLs at and get results back. But it's not really true. Modern database is like more powerful computational environment, which is, you can do a lot of stuff inside. And Postgres is no different, and by far it's the only one database that offers you two-dimensional extensibility. So you can create a language, and within that language you can create a procedure and code. And there are quite, quite a many languages inside Postgres database. One of my favorite languages is PGPL SQL, which is loosely based on Oracle PL SQL, but of course there will never be any NC standard for this because too, ma too many uh, lines of code depends on it. It's a full-fledged language, offers you uh, conditionals, loops, extend, uh, exceptions, um, dynamic uh, SQL, cursor processing. You can do quite a lot of with the language. And what is the advantage of running code inside database? It's locality of data. So the, the code should run close to the data because the speed of light is, is not infinite. And at certain point, you will hit the the uh, limits. Also, there are some other um, advantages to run uh, code inside database. You can reduce network traffic. You can use encapsulation. You ha don't have to expose uh, tables to users. You can expose nice API, and of course, increased in security. And there's, there are all, there are tons of functions already implemented in Postgres for managing strings, date, dates, uh, integers and any other environmental um, uh, aspects of Postgres, but there is also a way to extend it using a C-level, which I have chosen too. And as if you want to start server type programming, there's a lot of documentation online on the official site of Postgres. 
So, uh, first I want to explain the motivation behind this uh, extension. And in order to do that, I have to remind you what you are, ex what you are offered as a server side programmer once you are connected to the database. So, you have a backend process which um, works in, in behalf of your name, which has access to shared uh, memory, to logs, to IO subsystem, and most importantly, it provides an execution context for your code. Uh, which you can you have to ch share this co this execution context with the server uh, when you go to a SQL engine to the kernel of the database, and I like to think of Postgres as a main data hub po po uh, computational environment, and this is why I wanted to have an abstraction of threads, and in stock version you you don't have anything like that, you can of course create parallel processing, but you have to go outside of the database. You have to write some code uh, in Python or Java uh, using um, connection pools, create many parallel sessions and do those processing, but this is uh, from the server-side programmer is not very um, convenient. So I use extensions to the rescue, and that's why PG threads were born. And I borrowed an API out of many um, threading uh, models there, I chose the API from POSIX threads and created only four simple primitives that let you manage fully um, this um, new entity. So the thread has a name, which is a unique identifier. Thread has a thread procedure, which is any running context needs to have some code to run. And also there's a mysterious parameter host name, which is um, um, because I extended also this to run on many servers. So right now we can safely assume that it's null. Um, then there's a start thread. Once the thread, thread, thread is created, you can start it. Then you can synchronize with the join and finally clean up after it and destroy. And this is the PGA um, threads, some implementation details. I'm using libpq client library and asynchronous query execution. This is important because it let me decouple the calling thread from the call thread, so I don't have to um, wait for the query in the foreground. I can just let it run and then synchronize with join later. And I'm exposing the thread state via a regular table thread list, so we can query uh, the state of each thread. A thread has three states, created, running, and finished. And this API is still in Staten Ascendi, so it may change in the future, maybe. Um, I'm using the uh, user, name, user given name as an identifier. It should be perhaps um, system generated, something like GUID. So data separation. So local variables and local temporary tables, because they run in a backend process, they are naturally separated. And data sharing between threads are implemented using regular uh, Postgres tables. And it's now for simple um, demonstration, so I can demonstrate you a life cycle of such a, a thread. Um, so this is the uh, thread list table. It should be empty now. And I have here, yes. Uh, this is the example step by step creating the thread. So you create threads and give it name T each one and using PG sleep stock version of procedure with times um, sleeping 10, 10 seconds. So we can um, we can trace uh, changing in states. Oh, not here. Okay, so now we should have yes, we have thread one created. Um, this is host name, so it exposes already the, um, the host where, where it was created. This is the date when it was created, and then CID is a um, backend process which supports this thread. Because I'm not inventing here a wheel, I'm not doing any dramatic changes inside the core of Postgres because it would be overkill. I'm just using existing uh, infrastructure, a Postgres backends, and just created an API for the server programmers to use it, to be able to um, work with threads. So we, if we start the thread, it actually kicks out the uh, thread procedure. Oh, sorry. And uh, you see it, it's changed the state to running. 
we, we, it should be about 10 seconds. We can keep on refreshing this. Oh, yeah, that's finished. It's automatically finished. It, we, it didn't block the calling uh, thread. It was running in the background. So after that, we should join the thread. So we, should, we could join the thread before, and it would be blocking calls. So it would be waiting for this. But right now, it's just a non-blocking call. Uh, oh, sorry, here. And, and finally, destroy the thread. So it should show now. Yeah, it's, it's emptily. So this, is, this was the life cycle of a thread. And there's another demo, which I called idles. I have this idle loop uh, procedure which does nothing but burn CPU cycles, but it will have this uh, side effect that you will see um, in the mass on a machine that, that there are four Postgres or two Postgres um, backends that are doing something. So let's uh, create those threads here. And again, uh, they are started, created. Then we can start the threads, and they should be running this idle loop and doing nothing. And at the same time, we can see there should be uh, two Postgres, uh, yeah, two Postgres, uh, two Postgres processes that running at 100% of CPU. And uh, they are finished now, so we can clean up after them. Okay, so this is the basics of the of threads. So let's go back to the presentation. And yeah, the, those threads need to communicate. So I've come up with two types of classes of API. One is non-transactional API, which lets you uh, communicate uh, between threads, and by definition through regular session because threads are based on uh, Postgres uh, backends. And um, this a kind of API uh, doesn't obey the transaction boundaries. So you can uh, have, for, for instance, a long-running function, a long transaction in a function that every thousand loops, for instance, uh, uses this API to report on its pro uh, pro uh, progress, and the other session can simply report it to the user or, or put it in the table. And um, this API is loosely based on Unix pipes. There are private and public pipes. Uh, there are dif differences that uh, public pipes can be read and written to by anybody, and public and private pipes can be uh, ri written and read only by the same user that was created those pipes. And also, those pipes are exposed by uh, in a table. And this is important that it's not persistent. So if you restart the server, those messages are gone, because it's not transactional, so I don't have to do anything with logs, wall logs. And it, it's inter most interestingly, it uses dynamic background worker process, pipe server. We can evidence this uh, and on the ma machine with the server. Yes, this pipe server is a part of Postgres instance. And well, there are some advantages, but I'm not hiding this. I, I based this uh, API on Oracle similar. If you know Oracle, there is a DBMS pipe um, implementation there, so I based it on this. And uh, time for a few demos, for instance. Um, I can have now two sessions open and, and uh, to the master server, and this is the pipe example. So uh, you, you create, uh, there's a concept of a bu message buffer. You can, this is poly polymorphic. You can add any number of types to it. And it has the structure of it, so it do don't get confused. So uh, once you uh, send this, you can then uh, check that the message is there from PG pipe table. So there's uh, uh, pipe name test, 
as evidenced by by the name of the of the of the pipe and there's one message in it in it if i can i can repeat it, that there should be two messages so and uh, we can receive that using receive message and uh, unpack also we we sent integer double and string and there should be another one perhaps yes if I do it now, it will wait because there's no message in there. So I can perhaps send it once more time and it receives again. So here it was blindingly uh, uh, trying to guess the type, but uh, there's a, a function that you can probe the type of the next item in the buffer and just use proper unpack. So um, there's another cool demo for this. I have a little server client application for this. Um, um, this is the uh, server. It listens on the pipe and you can pass it oh, I'm sorry. a simple operator. Simple operator and two arguments and it will do the computation for you. And For instance, we can add one and two. Okay, because it was time on, sorry. Okay, it's not this one. Uh, just, just select web server. Okay, so we can now repeat this. Okay. And An empty operator ends this so okay this is uh, important thing yeah I should show it because I can start transaction here uh, and also here and it will work the same because it doesn't obey the transaction binaries so again pipe server and so it doesn't matter so this is kind of non-transactional app API Okay, let's go back to presentation. The other type of API, API is um, transactional API. And the stock Postgres version has a listen notify, PG notify function, but it has a limitation and there's no timeout and it's difficult to pass data programmatically. So I decided to implement, again, based on Oracle, uh, DBMS alert, which is transactional communication. You can use it to synchronize on transaction boundaries between session and threads. So if one session is waiting for another to complete large transaction, on co the, uh, it will simply notify the other session and on commit, this other session will wake up and can continue. And yes, this obeys the transaction boundaries. If the transaction is not committed, the alert is not sent. It is loosely based on Unix signals, but it has the potency property and it's persistent. So restart of database will keep the alerts in the database. You can use it for communication with external service. And I have one uh, demo for this using little Java program that uses that um, interface. It's, I will fire up perhaps two, even, even two instances of this program, so make more impression. So this is, um, it works on a single table and has an interface to listen for the changes in this. So if I go to uh, maybe uh, 
if I go to um, this, the, the, the table it listens to is called test table. It's over here. It's, uh, I have the same data. I can simply insert a new word, new word for it. I don't know, maybe Cape Town. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. And those programs got automatic notification, and you can see Cape Town appeared automatically on the, on the, on the list. And the same, it works at the same time, and the same uh, pro the same way, if I change something using um, user interface, so I can, for instance, delete it here, and again, it is um, automatically notified. It uses, uses this uh, PG alert. It works like this, that there is a trigger on this table after insert, update, or delete. So whenever something, some, something in a completely different application changes the value of anything in this table and commits, then those get notifications. So you can work with outside application as well. Okay. Let's go back to presentation. Uh, and this is now putting all this together, and this is example application, which is pretty trivial, may you say, but it's uh, solving a game inside database. So how cool is that? You can solve data. So uh, let me uh, introduce you uh, the game. The game is uh, called Wordament. It's originally from Microsoft. It has became popular as a mobile application. You can use a touch interface. And it displays you a four time four board with random letters. And you uh, are trying to find words that you know. And you are get getting bonus points for each word. And uh, yeah, there's some rules. There's limit time limitation and a three letter number minimum length of, uh, of the word. And it's great for is learning new words and uh, I can uh, I can I have first the solution in a single thread that you can use it in the stock Postgres version and then I in gradual steps I will introduce this uh, threading um, model to solve it faster so data structures and this it's, it's, it's very easy it's using a um, a string as a starting with an empty string and and tries to um, move on the board in every of eight possible direction append the word and check in the database um, which has a dictionary of valid words if there is a word uh, there is perfect match we append it to the list of solutions if there is no perfect match but it, it's a prefix of some existing word we keep on with that algorithm and if there is no possible match we do pruning so you can imagine there is quite a number of possibilities to theoretical possibilities to build a word, but using this pruning and uh, via data dictionary of valid words, we can um, significant, significantly reduce the number of possible solutions and runtime. So it supports Unicode because Postgres supports Unicode. And as a respect to South Africa, I added support for Africans language. So, <laughs> so we can verify uh, if it works correctly. Uh, this is one cool one-liner, so I loaded African words in the database, in one transaction and one statement. So uh, now let's play. Um, the user in callable interface for solving this is called play. It's a function that takes one string argument, which represents, uh, have four segments of four letters separated by space, and each uh, segment represents one row in a, in, a, in, a, in a board. So if we hit select, it will show you all the possible solutions. And when I was preparing the slides for this presentation, I chose especially this one because it shows you the very long word you can build on the small, um, on this, uh, on the small board. So let's go to a uh, presentation to show you how it works in a reality now. Okay. I have some examples here. Okay, this is the example from the slides. 
Okay, it does exactly the same. It's, it runs slightly faster because I got new computer, which is have better better CPUs. Um, so we can support different languages, for, in, for instance, Germans with those umlauts, and algorithm works on, on a view. So if I repoint the view to a dictionary table for the language, I can simply build words uh, in different languages. Okay, and now for the South African. I will not hiding, I have especially chosen the string, so you, you can be impressed with the long of the word. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this is how it works. So, but this is the single single thread solution now. So let's go back to English. And uh, and yes, and we can go back to presentation. Okay, then I'm go, let's go back to the game. This is uh, I've chosen game because game is um, uh, games are in general are problems with so-called embarrassing para, para, uh, para, uh, embarrassingly parallel. So it means that you can run several instances of a game. Yeah, you, you can play chess with many players. You can solve uh, the game using many threads because this algorithm starts with the initial um, tile on the board. And there are 16 possible uh, routes of, of this. Uh, so there are possibility for up to 16 parallel process processes to solve partial the game. And um, so word amend game is no other than that. And for the and this is uh, this shows you the idea of what I'm intending to do. Uh, for the solution in a single thread, I'm using a local temporary table for solution, so each uh, this table was is is private for the session, and um, we need to find some way to mix and match the number of possible threads to the number of initial tiles. So, for instance, if you have two threads, you can give two bottom, uh, two top rows to one thread and two bottom to the other threads. If you have even non uh, evenly visible, like three, that would be six, five, five. So roughly uh, the same, uh, the same name, the same uh, load for each each thread. And okay, and here's the time for the demo. I wrote a, a bit the solution, and now it's called Play Parallel, which has exactly the same arguments. But you can also specify the parallelism level, and also for the present for the sake of this presentation, I extended the game so it doesn't have to be limited to four times four. It can be any square, like with six or eight. And um, and right now, the, the one extension of the algorithm is that each thread is working on its own local solution, and when it's finished, it's appended to the G solution, which is a global solution for for. This is a regular uh, Postgres table, so that if all threads are finished, the final solution is in one G solution table. And so we can run this one with parallelism, let's say. Okay, uh, okay so it runs with two threads par in parallel, so it took 9.4 seconds, but if we increase the number of threads, we can see that it scales almost linearly. If we give him eight, there will be the tears, the linearity breaks because I don't have eight uh, CPUs on my machine. And if you give it even more, there will be uh, perhaps no improvement because there is also um, uh, some overhead for context switch between them. So. At every scale, linear scale-up system breaks at a certain point if, if it runs out of resources. So, so this is how it works. And um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so this was the scaling up. So, if we add more um, CPU resources to the single machine, bigger machine, then 
will be uh, better parallelism. But in fact, today's um, trends are that we're not using big machines, but rather commodity hardware and lots of them. And therefore, scaling out is the keyword. So uh, I th was thinking how to scale out the solution and uh, came with an idea using uh, logical replication between uh, those servers. So there's another server running a uh, logical replication, and there are two sets of uh, replications. Normally, there is only one way replication, but they have two way replication. So inputs are pushed from the master to the slave. Inputs are the dictionary tables, so uh, they are mostly read only, uh, so that the threads can work locally with data. And uh, outputs, the, the G solution is here and here. There is a backward replication from the slave to the master, so the master has the final view at the, at the end of the algorithm. And bidirectional replication is normally not supported in Postgres, but providing that those replicated data sets do not overlap. Otherwise, you will have an infinite loop. You can try it, but it doesn't work yet. And OK, if the number of uh, outputs is large, you can alter alternatively use for foreign data wrappers and database links. You don't have to physically copy the data. I can access that remotely. But I've chosen this publication and subscription model. And also, it would be interesting to, uh, to test this with BDR. BDR is a product from uh, post second quadrant, which has proper bidirectional replication. But I didn't test it because it's, I think, closed source now. Uh, so, OK, so now we can um, back go come to back to the demo. And let me now first exp mm, expose one more table there. It's called host list. And here is where I keep the topology of the cluster. And also, um, because connecting requires so authentication, so I have to store somewhere passwords and the connection to build a connection string at it. And you have also last column enabled, and so far the slave was disabled. I can uh, select the host enable. So it now is enabled for parallel processing on different um, two nodes. To evidence that, I have also a shell on the slave machine, and you can see top. And we can run this uh, large, even larger example, perhaps, because it will be a bit longer, so you can see it better. Uh, for instance, this one. Just that will be non solvable for humans, I guess. Okay, it's running, and you can see that Postgres process is running. Uh, okay, so it's solved pretty quickly. Also, it's interesting if I run it here. In another session, I can show you. Oh shit. Uh, this thread. At least, okay. Maybe okay. I can capture the, the, sta the status. So you see that some of the um, threads were running on master, some of the slave, so the load was distributed. And it's done by the way that there is a little scheduler that looks at this table, whether it's enabled or not. And if you give that create thread parameter null for the host, it will see which threads are already running on master and which are slave, and we'll try to balance it, so distribute the load. And um, yeah, and this is pretty much all for the presentation. I hope, I didn't hope that I'd make, make it to the end, uh, because it's a lot of stuff. I, may, I could um, tell you even more, but there's perhaps no time. I would like to leave some time for questions. And yeah, this is um, 
And this is some details how it works. And so we didn't have to change anything. So the parallel solution from the single uh, single database instance, we didn't have to change. We only added the um, the publication subscriptions to shift shift data between the servers. And yeah, this is about the scheduler. And um, yeah, and this is yeah. So I proved that this scales out. Maybe even even I can sh show you that. It with this multiple hosts, it should be even faster with eight, because now, well now I can run 12, for instance. Yeah, okay, pretty much. If, it, if, it, if this were a real machine, it would be faster. I can, I can assume you. So, um, And I just want to say, okay, this is the picture of how it works. So we have parallelism uh, at the um, single node level. We have input and output publication subscriptions, and the slave is doing all this job. And it would in theory support um, the star-like architecture with one master and many slaves. Uh, with master with um, working as a, uh, um, a coordinator of this of this of all those work, but I. I have only resources for two machines, so, but it pretty much shows you how it could work. And so the conclusions, um, Postgres itself is inherently parallel environment, but in stock version we don't have, uh, as a server-side programmers, ability to take advantage of it, other than going outside and building a third-party application. Um, we need, um, the Postgres itself supports, of course, par par parallelism since version 10 and with, with uh, parallel workers, and more and more features are already parallel. And um, yeah, I would like to test this BDR environment, but perhaps there are guys from Second Father and I can talk to them. And yeah, that will be pretty much the same. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions. <laughs> I just want to say that this was uh, my hobby project. Nobody paid for me. Um, I like, I'm, I'm a real, real DevOps these days. I, I was always DevOps, so even if this buzzword was invented, uh, I, was, I had inclination to administration and development at the same time. I don't know if this has any practical um, application in reality. Um, I just wanted to show that power Postgres is a powerful computational environment, extensible, and you can do pretty much inv your imagination is a limitation for it. Okay, so that will be it. Okay, um, I'd like to ask a question. I wanted to ask two. The first one is, you did a PG alert, as to p but you mentioned um, Listen Notify. Um, why didn't Listen Notify do what you wanted? Um, and uh, th that's the first question. And then the second one, I just want to check. So if we start, if I do a query and I start it as a thread, mm -hmm. and that thread um, encounters an error, um, does yes. it roll back? Is, is, is the thread itself transactional, and how do I read the responses? Yes, because it, was, it is based on um, it was based on Postgres 10, so I had to the thread procedure is a function, so it has to run in a transaction, and I can demonstrate what happens if you have. With four threads, if you have, um, because it has parser and uh, checking the the validity of, of if it's squareness property, so it, this happens, right? So uh, those threads got, those threads got uh, non-square uh, board for parsing. They detected it, and each of them throw an exception, and and because I'm in a in a play parallel uh, function, I'm using. Uh, I'm joining the thread here. No, it's um, yes, it's a here. And if there's uh, join thread, if it's non-zero, it's uh, join thread uh, result um, returns the exit code from the thread function. So if it's non-zero, I assume this error, and I can uh, each thread stores the. Uh, exception string in its uh, thread local area, and so we can uh, collect it using this join thread and display. So this is why how it works. In, if you are interested how this 
um, looks like, I mean, um, what really is run there, there's, um, there's error log here. So this is what what is um, this asynchronous query, the whole thing, this uh, from here to here. So it, it builds anonymous uh, block where it calls um, this um, thread procedure, which is play range in this uh, example. Play range is just for uh, load distribution in between. So it takes the tile 61 to 81 and try, tries to solve this um, string. Then uh, there's some uh, housekeeping, perform post thread, start thread. So if start thread, it changes its um, state itself from um, created to running, because it is in transaction, so it wouldn't be visible in another session. So it has to done in here. Then it catches ex any exceptions in there. And then... Uh, if there are exceptions, then also there's this post start, which stores this um, um, any exit code and exception strings, and then commits. So, in version 11, I could create true um, thread procedures because, okay, um, okay, it's uh, okay. Then why? Because uh, first of all. Uh, I didn't knew that actually you could use PG notify and table because there is a parameter you can set timeout so for every SQL in there. But I didn't knew this, and perhaps it was some overkill. For this. One more question. Yes. Sorry. Mm, yes, perhaps yes, right. but. Not that easily, because PG, PG SQL uh, naturally integrates with SQL engine, so we can just write insert, update, delete, uh, and it works. With PG Python, perhaps you have to more explicitly to handle. Okay, thank you.